Hey, Michael, how's it going? Yes, yes, very well, everybody. Good, good afternoon. I am enjoying the sun. Uh, you'll all be pleased to know I've just come from a run, so I'm feeling energized. <laughs> and I have just had brunch. So, so I, I could be in a worse position, but, but thank you for asking. I'm, I'm Excellent. Very... <laughs> and is it, I'm, I'm reliably informed on LinkedIn that it could be your birthday today. Is that true? It could be. Corey, it could be, but, but what we will, <laughs> thanks very much, uh, uh, Richard. What we'll do is we'll neither confirm nor deny those, those rumors. <laughs> you don't even say the... which birthday, Michael. You can just say, yeah. <laughs> fair point, fair point. No, thank you, everybody. R really Happy nice birthday. to be here. Thanks so much. Thanks for joining everyone so far. We'll just give it another couple of minutes to allow a few more joiners and, and then we'll be kicking off shortly. Okay, I think we'll uh, we'll kick it off there. Hi everyone, thank you very much for joining us uh, today. My name is Korai Kamgoz. I'm the Director of Communications and Marketing at the PRCA, and welcome to this discussion on the future of earned media in the UK in partnership with Three Monkeys, Zeno, and Karma. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, just a couple of housekeeping rules before we get going. Um, we are planning on recording today's session. Um, so do bear that in mind. Um, and obviously, we'd love to hear from as many of you as possible. So if you do hear any thoughts or if anything uh, inspires a suggestion or, or, or you'd like to share anything that um, <clears throat> or build on anything that any of our panelists have mentioned, please do feel free to raise your hands. Um, we'll be delighted to bring you up uh, to the stage so you can join the conversation. Um, so we're now one year, well, we're past the one year mark uh, of the first lockdown. And it's fair to say that every aspect of uh, modern life has been touched by the pandemic. And the media is certainly no exception in that regard. And although longer term trends have been shaping UK news for a decade and a half, following the near simultaneous emergence of social media, smartphones and the global financial crisis, COVID-19 has certainly supercharged these. And to explore these trends, Three Monkeys Zeno have published a, a new report, Viral News, reflecting on how the pandemic has changed the media, what this holds for the future, and how agencies and clients should change in response. So that very much sets the tone of the discussion uh, for today. And I'm really pleased to say we're joined uh, by an expert panel of guests to discuss the current state of the earned media landscape. Uh, so joining us today, we have Richard Price, Editorial Director at Three Monkeys Zeno. Uh, we also have uh, Richard Bagnall, co-managing partner at Karma and chairman of Amec. Uh, we have Richard's colleague, Orla Graham, who's an account director at Karma. We have Ed Campbell, who's a news editor at BBC News. And we also have Michael Mpofu, head of communications at Worry and Peace. <clears throat> so, Ed, I might if I I'll start with you if I if I may. Um, we're really interested to have a little bit of a, a chat about how the pandemic um, has impacted the news agenda uh, for you at the BBC. Any, any short any thoughts you could uh, share with us on that? Yeah, so I guess my um, uh, first thought on that is that um, one one of the thoughts I think um, to that question is how, how sort of quickly did the news agenda change. And um, quite interesting uh, organisation to be in the BBC for a perspective on that, because I, I guess the answer is, you know, at first quite slowly and then very, very quickly indeed. So um, uh, I think we're all familiar um, pre-pandemic with the, the, the kind of story we thought this was going to be. So, you know, we know the story of SARS, uh, Ebola, um, which are essentially both um, pathogens that were quite localised to um, uh, different parts of the world and that 
you know, I think we all kind of accept that they would have had a significant effect if they sort of if they got to us, uh, but they didn't. Um, and then we've had sort of um, pandemic scare stories seem to come around every few years, and they're normally around different strains of flu. And indeed, that's what the um, country's pandemic preparedness plan was was based on. And again, they they you know swine flu, bird flu, you know they've always sort of petered away. So I think there was a bit of an expectation. Uh, from people that this might be that kind of story and it might be essentially about the outbreak of a slightly weird disease in the Far East. Um, Obviously, one of the things about the BBC is it's got this sort of global footprint and it keeps um, bureaus all over the world. So we did start to get just internally, as well as just reporting the story, uh, which at the time was really a story about stuff, stuff happening on cruise ships and then a bit later, you know, people from cruise ships being flown home and kept in quarantine in hospital wings and hotels and that sort of thing. But, but, but in, but we was at the same time getting a drumbeat from, you know, big hubs that the BBC has in places like Singapore and all that kind of stuff where there were lockdowns going on and um, they were having to adapt their ways of working. And we were starting to do a lot of sort of resilience planning behind the scenes uh, around that, as I think a lot of companies were, but it still didn't kind of, seem completely real um and then just in preparation for this chat i was just flicking through some whatsapp messages i sent my wife around this time last year and there's there's one on um the the 12th of march and it's a screenshot of a running order which is essentially a a grid of all the stories that are going to be in a given news program and each story as i'm sure you're familiar has a slug which is that is the name of that story the slug on every single story in the six o'clock news that night was virus. It, the the grid just went virus, 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 virus. Uh, and I sent it over to her and I said, you know, there's just only one story around tonight. And I think that was at the moment that it kind of, you know, there's a turning point between it being a story that was happening out there and a story that was happening here and it was only going to get bigger. And it suddenly became clear, I think, to a lot of us around that time it was going to completely dominate our lives. So you then got this period of the next week or so, week or two, between about the 16th and 23rd of March, which was a sort of, there was a rising tide, but we were still getting things like the Cheltenham Festival going ahead. And uh, obviously we were doing things like issuing staff with, you know, laptops and home working kit and all that kind of stuff. And I, at the time, you know, I had two long-term investigations, which were, had cost many, many thousands of pounds. Um, and were kind of global investigations. And uh, essentially, stories like that at that point were just being binned, uh, however much had been spent on them. And then we were obviously into lockdown. And since then, there's been a sort of total domination of the news agenda by COVID, which happened very quickly and was initially a story about the disease and a a sort of a health story and a, a political story. But has moved beyond that and rapidly moved into the sphere of, um, uh, you know, the economy and business and uh, everyday life. And if you just I just try to think about, you know, at that time and I had quite a strange experience because during the first lockdown, I spent most of my time in the office. And then since that lockdown eased, I've spent most of my time working from home. But during that time, there were very, you know, and still very limited amount of people in the BBC offices, as you can imagine. And that is essentially the news desk, the health team and the business team. And that really tells you about what kind of stories are dominating. Uh, so the, 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 the COVID story in its various forms has just squeezed out all of that space at the top of the bulletin, you know, the front of the paper um, and everything else is um, uh, either about COVID in some kind of way or is almost an antidote to that story. So, I mean, that's the the, the broad overview of um, uh, how things change over those few months. Thank, thanks for that, Ed. It's a really useful way of framing the discussion. Um, Richard or, or Rob, interested to, to get either of your perspectives on this. I mean, Ed referred to that squeeze on the news agenda. Um, and what's, what's the impact of that from a client's perspective? And, and, and what are you seeing that uh, reflect some of those trends that Ed touched on? Well, it changed the rules, um, as simple as that. The rules prior to that, we, we, had, we had a certain cadence. We knew the sort of thing that would, that would have an impact. We knew how to position our clients in a way that would enable them to have their voices heard. 
Um, it's not always a straightforward process in any time, um, but it but it became immeasurably more complex to have your voice heard because there was such a cacophony of COVID news at the time, um, and and that led to some. There had to be some quitty, pretty quick thinking, um, and one of the one of the initial challenges was, you know, getting clients to understand that the world has changed. Um, in in pretty much every aspect of life. And one of the ways it's changed is that things that previously we knew would land, we we, we could say where they would land and and pretty well when they would land. Well, we lost the where a little bit because if if on that day something had happened and invariably it had, um, you, you couldn't say that we know this publication is going to be interested and there's going to be space for it because the where was already full. The location's totally full. But what we really, what really changed more than that was the when. So when can an organization that has something important to say be heard saying it? So if you were to say, say you, say you, say you had a massive client, a global, a globally known name, you know, one of the massive ones, and they were announcing a, a big new product launch. And you could say, all right, we're going to do it on the 17th of March. And, uh, and we're going to do all these big things. And it's going to be really innovative and creative and everyone's going to love it. Um, and then that day, you just find out that 100,000 people are infected with COVID. It's, yeah. it, it would just disappear. Um, and so what we found was, very quickly, we had to acknowledge that you you don't get to choose how to play in the pandemic. You have to be ready. You have to respond when the time is right. And that's the challenge. And do you feel as though that's still very much the case now? Um, so that has there been has there been a difference, say, you know, uh, since the the cruise ship phase, if you like, that, that Ed was referring to earlier uh, until till now? Has there been a shift in the way that that's evolved? Well, when you when you mentioned cruise ships, it brings me out in a little bit of a, a a cold sweat because because indeed we we were we were involved in that at the time, uh, exactly when the pandemic when 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 the lockdown was announced, I was about two days off a cruise ship, um, and uh, th- that we were representing, and it was a very very challenging time. What I would say is this: it is still a very challenging time. Um, but I think that with, in, with, with intelligent application, you can, you can understand, we, we understand the ground rules now, right? One thing we understand is that things are changing so quickly. Uh, it's, a real, it's a real benefit to know what you don't know, but to have your system set up. So what I would say is this, if you've got something good to say, get all your ducks in a row, get everything together, all your assets, really understand it understand why it matters and then be ready i always use this avocado analogy but it's not yet not yet not yet not yet now too late you have to be ready for the now and because we're ready we've learned we've all all of us have learned we've all adapted and i think that's one way in which in comms we've we've adapted that's fascinating and i'd I'd like to come back to something that you um just pointed out in 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 a moment um richard wonder if i could bring you in here um richard bagnall we've got a couple of richards in uh, on the stage um but <clears throat> we've just heard about how there's been a, a huge shift in um the difficulty really with uh, clients having their news heard because of all the disru- disruption that's taken place um, from a measurement and an evaluation point of view what knock-on effect has that had um, and are there any um pieces or thoughts you'd like to share on 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 what you've heard so far yeah hi guys well i mean look what a what a great um beginning of this conversation which has brought me out in cold sweats just a thought of you know just just reliving the 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 past year because of course i think the key thing that, that that happened which we all are very aware of is that normality as we all knew it and had had, had come to expect it had just completely changed there is no longer um, a normal in our lives and so therefore what's the knock-on effect that that has uh, to the world of how you look at comms how you monitor it how you how you measure and evaluate it and it means that everything has changed it means that um, the behavior of our audiences have have changed the way that they 
um, uh, they they read and interact with the media. I think uh, the the excellent report uh, that that was produced shows that I think visits to the BBC news site uh, more than doubled in 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 three months. If we look into that data in more detail, we'll see that the times of day that people uh, were engaging with the <clears throat> with the media were were totally different. Um, we're seeing uh, levels of trust go surging in first the government um, and then dropping away significantly um, as well. In the crisis, people want to trust their um, want to trust their leaders. Um, we've even seen uh, up, upsurges in in how people how religious people are and sort of almost like you might call that a, a, a trust in God. What does this mean in terms of monitoring and measurement or well, things like benchmarks have gone out of the window, anything that you might have been measuring against um, last year, last quarter, last month, if we think back to March last year, um, are no longer relevant. We need to think about new benchmarks, competitors that we might have been looking at and peer groups all changed as businesses um, pivoted. The targets have to change. Um, the time frames, the velocity of our reporting, I, I, I like to think of it perhaps as a bit of we need to think fast and we need to think slow if 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 organizations won't weren't doing social media digital monitoring they need to be doing they need to be doing things like search listening yeah. um as, as as well uh, they need to be reporting you know no longer is it good enough to send a report on a quarterly basis you need to be thinking about updating just the key information on perhaps a daily basis or even even more more regular than that. So the velocity, the time frames have changed. But you also need to think about um, the um, not just counting the stuff that's easy to count, but actually proving the value of PR in a meaningful way. And that's where I, I think about it in terms of fast and slow. We need to have fast reporting, but slow, slower uh, digestion and meaning needs to come through and perhaps we'll pick up on that a bit later in today's conversation yeah and Richard it's interesting because you and I were speaking not that long ago um on, an, on another one of these discussions about how um, there's more of an, a need or there's more pressure on, on organizations in-house teams agencies to show, prove the, the value of their work um as budgets mm -hmm. are cut teams are becoming smaller um, and just as it's becoming harder for clients to have their voice heard in the media, there, there's more pressure on, on practitioners than, than at any point before. So do you see that as being a good thing in the long term for the, um, for the measurement and evaluation of, of PR going forward? Yeah, I mean, it, it's critical, isn't it? Uh, the way I think of it is all around the world, CFOs are, are hovering over budgets with red pens in their hands, um, looking to preserve cash. Uh, and looking to stop any spend on on what might be seen as wasteful activity. And the challenge with PR is that if PR just does activity that it can't demonstrate that it's linking through to organisational value and organisational benefit, um, it can be perceived as just a luxury. It's almost like a, a busy fool. You know, we're just doing stuff. But what does it mean to an organization? And I'm afraid, you know, the hard message is that saying that we got X billion impressions or 50,000 retweets or likes or shares uh, on, on social and digital channels is frankly irrelevant. No CFO wants you to generate likes, shares, tweets, impressions. They want you to support their organizational outcome. So it makes it more critical than ever that PR moves beyond measuring what we call the outputs, the, 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 the tactics, the activity, the, the counts and amounts, those perhaps sometimes known as vanity metric, those big numbers that don't really mean anything. And we move beyond that to saying, OK, well, how has this, you know, in terms of organisation objectives, what were they? Are they about shoring up reputation, awareness, knowledge? Are they more... Uh, more tangible things like driving sales, share price, you know, whatever it might be. And of course, all these different PR and communications programs have different objectives. You need to measure um, in, a, in, a, in a different way according to, to, to each use case. And, and yeah, just to sort of plug for AMEC, you mentioned I'm the chairman of AMEC. Um, that's what the Integrated Evaluation Framework, which is a, uh, a wonderful resource on AMEC's website at amecorg.com forward slash framework it's free to use it's an educational resource and it explains to pr pros 
um, all over the world in 22 different languages exactly how to do what I'm talking about. Yeah, I, I couldn't reiterate that, uh, uh, recommend it more highly. It's a, it's a fantastic resource, so do, do check that out. Um, Michael, um, I'm keen to get your perspective. We've heard so far, obviously, a really fascinating overview from Ed and um, both Richards from uh, the news angle, but also the, the agency side and the knockout side. You're head of comms at Worry and Peace in-house. Um, interested to get your take on um, the state of the current and media landscape and what trends you've noticed um, over the past 12 to 13 months. Yeah, thanks, Corey. And, and you know, incredible, incredible insight from, from everybody. But just to p- perhaps latch on to what uh, Richard, who's just gone before me, said, you know, the, the reality is we, I've come to realise you know, mid-pandemic, you're working in an, an insure tech, trying to prove concept. So, so there's obviously a lot of this noise, but one of the key things that we came to realize was how we measure has to change. So it became a lot less about volume in terms of, you know, how many hits are we getting, but the quality of the hits. Uh, in other words, are we putting our story in front of the right people? And you know, by right people, I mean the people with the necessary influence to shift the dial, uh, to turn the needle. So, so, so that kind of, of thinking, the measurement thinking, definitely high up there. I think the other aspect of it is the reality of the fact that the new cycle is dead. I, I resonate so much with that, with that idea. You know, we're living in a time where news is all around us, quite literally. I mean, you know, biggest, uh, you know, output that you can get in real time Twitter it's all happening and I think the the, the real job or responsibility and I'm, I'm sure Ed would would uh, have something to say about this is okay you know if you're the BBC you're looking at the timeline trying to pick out <laughs> the thing that should be highlighted in, you know amongst the chaos and I think this notion that we used to have new cycles and you know oh, the story will be dead by the weekend or let's wait for uh, you know, X announcements and then push that out, that's quite dead. And I think I'm really fascinated in, in, in how companies are, are able to adapt to that. Another aspect, I, I suppose, Corey, for me would be, you know, if you look at all the major stories over the last year that have really, you know, shaken uh, us to the core, have all been driven by, by you know, communities, right? So let's look at Marcus Rashford, what he did with, with you know... I think we could all agree, quite a really ridiculous issue where, you know, you, you, you have somebody who plays football to remind us how to take care of, of kids. Um, it took him to, you know, knock, knock on number 10's door. Uh, George Floyd, etc. All of these, con- you know, major issues took place because there were people on the ground who decided, actually, we now want to capture the new cycle and we are now going to determine how that's going to play out. And I think as, as, as comms and PR professionals, there's something to be said about not letting ourselves assume we know what people want to hear and not trying to be the experts, but maybe listening a lot more and th- letting that inform our strategy and our, our, our ideas. I actually believe, in fact, that a lot of the stories that we push out there w- should be and will be informed by you know what what a family is saying around the table and how they view our brands and not just what you know some manual or handbook says uh when you go through a course and of course i'm not knocking anything i'm just you know it's 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 just a perspective and i think uh, you know there'll be something to there is something to be said about younger newsrooms corey uh there's a key issue here which i mentioned to you on the phone yesterday which is really intriguing to me i you know you forget that the the media, you know, journalists themselves have been affected by cuts and, uh, you know, shrinking budgets and the idea that they don't have access to the level of resource. I think inevitably that means you're getting a lot more in, well, inexperienced in the traditional sense. Uh, people entering newsrooms a lot earlier, a lot less experience, but we're having to trust them a lot more to be sources. We're having to trust them a lot more to convey messages in an accessible and, and really... Uh, uh, yeah, accessible way. And finally, uh, I think there's going to be a huge shift in who the sources are. And when I say sources, I think traditionally, you know, if you're part of my background is politics and, you know, if you were trying to uh, 
uh, push a story or, or get the front page of, of you know, a Sunday publication, usually uh, you, you're trying to make sure that you've got a credible source. You're trying to make sure that you're triple checking your sources. And I think what, what COVID has done is it's allowed us and it's allowed everybody to be a lot more accessible because we're all at home and we're all working in a space that's virtual, it's actually far easier to get contact details and reach somebody and get them over the phone or, or Zoom call or whatever than, than previously. And I think that will impact how sources and stories are shared. So, so you know, those are just a few of the things that I see happening. But, but this notion we need to get away from, I think, that, oh, yeah, you know, we need to open up and get back to, well, there's going to be a, a hybrid of how we live and work. And let's embrace that. But also, let's, let's embrace how that will impact and shift the way we communicate. And, uh, yeah, I hope that's, that made sense. That, that was brilliant, Michael. There's so much uh, to, to take on from that. It's, it's great to get your, your insight on that. It really struck me when, you, when you're talking about the, the fact that the traditional news cycle is dead. And <clears throat> what came to mind is that uh, ridiculous announcement uh, that we all um, read earlier um, this week regarding the big six and the, the the big or the top six Premier League clubs breaking away, and the fact that that was scheduled to go out just before midnight. I mean, it was a complete yeah, right. mess and ridiculous, and it did make a mockery of that traditional uh, news cycle. Um, I, see, I can see a few people with uh, new faces in the room. If you have just joined us, we're um, having a, a chat about the general state of the UK and media landscape. Um, we've touched on a number of issues relating to. Um, how newsrooms have become under pressure um, and there's less of an opportunity really for uh, PR professionals to influence the agenda in the way that they were doing before. Um, and there's just actually on that, Ed, I'd, I'd like to come back to you if I may. We've, I mean, we've spoken so much about the various trends. One of the things that Michael uh, raised was an issue that we were talking about earlier this week um, with Michael Rashford's campaign and that being one of the, the kind of standout and media moments this uh, certainly over the past 12 to 13 years and Michael picked up on that communities aspect of it and would you agree that uh, would you agree that that was really what propelled it um, to prominence um, and what else about that campaign do you think made it as successful as it was yeah so um, just I guess just before answering the question um, which I will do um, it's just worth thinking a little bit about the context here. Um, so so um, there has been definitely, um, so I, I think firstly, one of the things the campaign has done, is, the, the, um, the pandemic has done, has it's accelerated stuff which is all, already out there. Um, so there's been a definite desire that we picked up on, especially at that early sort of scary stage of the pandemic, um, for some kind of positive news. And preferably news that is sort of light at the end of the tunnel regarding the pandemic itself. So if you think about the early stage, you know, uh, people were fascinated with anything around vaccines, treatments, any way that we might get out of this. Now, of course, that news was in short supply. I mean, it was non-existent at the start of the pandemic. There weren't any answers um, and there was no good news uh, about the, the, the disease itself. And against that, you have this inexorable grind of rising death figures and care homes and all this kind of stuff. And it just feels overwhelming and, and ghastly. And we have previously noted a wider trend. We know the news, um, even on a relatively good day, can produce significant feelings of sort of dread and anxiety for lots and lots of people. And this um, we've been tracked for quite some time now has led to a real desire, especially among younger people, uh, but among people in general, for what we call solutions-focused journalism. So that is obviously a traditional journalistic story is basically a bad news story. You know, it's about pointing out what's gone wrong, and that's an important function. Uh, but um, if you think about, you know, the news cycle even outside of COVID, the climate emergency, you know, ISIS, all this kind of stuff, um, people really want some sense of like agency and some sense of something happening, which is doing something to turn this around and preferably that they can have some sort of involvement or agency with. And if you take the green story, hopefully beyond sort of, you know, recycling their 
their yogurt pots and all that kind of stuff. So there, oh, there has been and there remains and it has accelerated a significant desire for stories that make people feel like they're taking back some control, psychologically speaking. So if you think about that early stage of the pandemic, um, there is no good news around. Uh, there's no vaccine at this point. There's no dexamethasone. Uh, and when you do get those stories, they're little islands in a sort of sea of kind of dread, I guess. So there's a rush at this time as well of people pushing a lot of stories which uh, basically do not sound that authentic or do not check out about how they can solve the problem. So, you know, there, uh, if you remember, there's a whole lot of people claiming that they could supply lots of PPE. Well, we sort of know how that turned out. Um, and um, uh, there are people, you know, uh, with, you know, technologies and stuff that they want to surface. And some of that is genuine and some of that is not. And, you know, some of that the BBC is blessed with a lot of highly skilled expert journalists who can help hopefully sort through that. But this psychological need about stories where there's a sense of positiveness, a sense of community and a sense of agency, even if it's not going to, you know, tackle the pandemic or defeat ISIS remains. So if you think about Rashford and you think about a few of the other sort of similar stories that are, that are in that kind of space, um, um, if we think first about the clap for carers, that was a, a, what I call the really sort of high fear stage of the pandemic. Um, and um, uh, people were feeling, I think, that they just wanted to do something to sort of show solidarity and, and, and sort of show support and be part of some, you know, the streets were empty at that stage, I'm sure you recall. Just they wanted to feel part of some sort of communal effort. So it's almost like people donating their saucepans to melt down into spitfires and it doesn't really matter if a spitfire gets made or not they feel that they've got some agency um it's interesting to think about that story now because when there was an attempt to revive it a little earlier this year um it actually got completely trashed on social media very very quickly and it 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 got it became subject to exactly those sort of um i guess culture wars kind of fault fault lines that that these sort of stories hopefully um uh are straddle. If you think about the Captain Tom story, that's probably somewhere in the middle. Um, it's been much more of a resilient story. There's obviously a strong sort of character attached to it. Um, there's a bit more of a feeling of agency. We saw quite a lot of sort of other people doing similar things and, and, and similar stories. But the Rashford one just did incredibly well. And I think the thing about that is there is tons of agency in that story. And there is a development and there is a narrative. And it's not simply revisiting the same thing because there's something being done there's an attractive authentic front man there uh, who uh, has lived you know part of that experience um, and there are practical steps that people and companies uh, can take to get involved and you know I was watching BBC Breakfast this morning and you know Tom Kerridge is now part of that story um, so that is a, a sort of perfect example, I think, of what I think of as that kind of high agency solutions focused story. You're not going to have that story in every place in the bulletin, but there's huge, huge uh, desire for that story, both within the pandemic and against the general background of this sort of feeling of kind of dread and hopelessness, which is often overtakes people when they think about these really, really big questions. And I'm sure, for instance, the massive engagement of young people in the you know, the extension rebellion is is part of the same phenomenon. This has this sorry, sorry to butt in, Corey, but this is Go something I feel quite strongly about. This this actually, you know, looking at it from our side of the fence, you know, Ed's in Ed's at the coal face of news. But this has big implications for brands, right? It has big implications for our businesses. And I, and one thing that that I, I've repeated a number of times with clients is when you're in a situation like that and everybody's seen the Rashford story and says, How can we be there? And, and a lot of the time you get asked the question, what can we do to be there? And actually, what you should be asking yourself is, because authenticity is so key, what are you already doing and can you build on that? Because if you look at the Tom Kerridge um, involvement, right, you think, oh, is anyone going to, you know, if, if, this was, if this was done in a clunking way, you could end up in a clap for carers situation. People are a bit sick of it. Say Marcus Rashford, you know, had made some missteps on social media. And it's worth making the point that he has, he has been absolutely uh, exemplary in his social media behaviour, that he hasn't been criticising people. It's been very positive 
Um, and when necessary, it's been silent. Um, but with a brand, if you're saying we're now going to start doing something, people see through that. But you know what? A lot of the time, companies are doing a lot of stuff. Um, brands are doing a lot of stuff. And if they're already doing it, you can't, people can't really fling mud at that, but it really is looking at that. And if you try and put on a costume and pretend to be something you're not, that way madness lies. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a great point. And it was such a brilliant story and <clears throat> brings together a lot of what uh, what we've discussed so far. Um, if you've just joined us, we're, we're having a, um, a discussion about the general state of uh, the UK and media landscape. Um, you may have noticed that we've got a red icon uh, beside our title today as well. So we are actually recording the session. So uh, do that, bear that in mind. But we'd, we'd love you to get involved. So if, if you do hear anything that sparks a thought, please do feel free to raise your hand so, can I, so that we can bring you to the stage. So go, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, thanks, Corey. I, I just want to speak now. It's my t- I'm kidding. I'm absolutely kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I actually just wanted to, to agree so strongly with Richard. I, 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 you know, I, the, purely because, and, and that's the issue, well, the issue for me with brands there's nothing wrong with brands, you know, the only reason I exist is because <laughs> I work for one, right? The, but I think that point, Richard, is so, so apt. The notion that somebody like Marcus comes out and says, hey, let's do something positive, let's help society, and then you get Brand X going, oof, uh, Richard, do you perhaps know what we could be seen to be doing? Uh, all, all of that, for me, I think it speaks to the point I was making earlier that people really probably are looking for uh, something that is so authentic that when you're sitting around, you know, your dinner table, it makes sense when you're chatting to your mates. You and I know when someone's pulling wool over your eyes and, we're, we're, you know, and maybe the best of intentions are behind it, but there needs to be a shift, I think, in, in how brands view their existence of course, look, they're all here. We are all here to make money. Let's make no mistake about that. But attached to that, there needs to be an underlying foundation that, you know, drives the vision. And, and, and people kind of understand now, you know, that we need to be taken a little bit more seriously if we're going to participate in this commercial exchange. Dead and right, so, Michael. And you know what, Michael? Just, yeah. and, and what's worse still is if you get people to believe you initially and then they find out right, that right. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, That's totally. even worse. That's even worse. And, and, and in fact, my, my advice, Richard, ironically, I, I spoke to a, a, a brand two days ago and, and he was saying to me, oh, what is your perspective on really, you know, getting to the media real quick and building? And I said to him, you know, sir, with greatest respect, if this thing is, a, if you want to be credible, sometimes you're going to have to put in the hard yards and it's the slow burn because you have to earn your place. And sometimes that's not sexy. And sometimes that looks like trying to call, call Ed. And sometimes that looks like doing before being seen to be doing. Uh, but ultimately, I think in the long run, when people try to look back and trace your story, there's a lot more credibility behind that. Forgive me for butting in there, Corey. I just felt so strongly. And no, I, I totally agree with Richard on that. It's a great point. Um, and I think one of the, the fascinating things about the, the Rashford story is that it, it ties in perfectly with what Ed was saying about the need for positive news um, and, and the thirst that, that we had for, for, for those stories. And Orla, um, I'm conscious that we, we haven't come to you yet. It'd be great to get your thoughts. Um, are you seeing uh, th- that reflected in the work uh, with you and your clients, that kind of thirst and, and demand for positive news stories? Yeah, I think that um, there's a lot of trying to figure out where you you fit into all of this, right? So there's, you know, people not wanting to be seen as jumping onto bandwagons, but also wanting to make sure that they are being seen as authentic. And I think that that's really where we have seen some very successful stories over the last year or so. You know, thinking about things like Captain Tom, for instance, we actually published a report on that last year. And one of some of the really key lessons for PRs that we came up with from it was that it's so important to be authentic. And exactly as Michael says, sometimes it's about doing before you're seen to be doing. I think that's such a great way of putting it. Um, You can't just do things performatively. People are 
they see through that right now. Um, I think that's kind of what happened with the clap for carers as well, is that, you know, it became so politicized because politicians were using it for their own benefit that people just thought, actually, no, I'm, I'm done with this now. It's not really achieving Yeah, that's anything. a good point. Um, but yeah, I think it's also about knowing your audience and about knowing kind of what they're looking for at a given point in time. So understanding what's actually going to be useful to them, what's going to be meaningful to them. And I think as well, it's also about looking at this over a long period of time. Um, you can't always figure out if you're being impactful within the space of a couple of days or a week or even a month sometimes. You need to be prepared to look at it over a longer period of time and put in place the kind of measurement to understand whether or not you actually are making um, inroads sometimes with these kinds of stories. Um, but yeah, I think that it's about try it's about picking the right kind of tone because I think what was important about things like Rashford and Captain Tom, for instance, last year was that they were positive news stories, but they weren't glossing over any of the things people were going through. And I think that is something that's just incredibly important at the moment. That it's been there's been a lot of backlash against various celebrities um, when they've sort of tried to do something. I mean, you think of the Gal Gadot um, Imagine video last year, which makes my toes curl even thinking about it. Yeah, rather yeah, not all of it. And, you know, it's about kind of not glossing over it. And that was the thing with both of those. It was focusing in on what can I do about something that is actually important. People are suffering. But rather than focus on just the fact that they are suffering, how can we do something about it? How can we bring people together? So I think it's about picking your moment, picking the tone correctly and being authentic. And that's what we're seeing increasingly more of our clients trying to to figure out how they measure that and to figure out how they can communicate that back within the C-suite, within their business, who maybe do want or think they can get some kind of fast um, answer to whether or not they've been successful or get some kind of big number that's just going to show them in a good light. And yeah, educating them to help them to understand that, no, there's a bit of a long slog that is needed for this. Um, it's, not, it's not a quick win that you can just jump um, from one point to another overnight. Yeah, hand it back to you there, Corey. Cheers. Thanks, all. A, a, a number of really good points there. I think the point you made about the sto needing the story to be grounded in uh, in reality is absolutely critical uh, and something that I, I imagine we'll be seeing far more of in, in, in the months and years ahead. Um, Rob, is there anything that you'd like uh, to add from a, from a client's perspective? I know Richard's shared a few thoughts on... Um, the impact of some of those trends on clients, but is there anything that's kind of stuck out for you over the past 12 to 13 months? Yeah, I think one of the big things that we've seen that's changed significantly is um, it's really sped up the use of data. Um, I think it's something that was always there. Clients were always asking us for it, but I think to understand everything that we've just talked about from, you know, the timing of your story to the combination of, um, you know, mainstream news, social media, um, even looking at sentiment and when to release things like good news stories and when to hold back. Um, we've seen way more clients coming to us and asking for much more sophisticated data um, to really understand, you know, their, their part in all of this, where they can and can't kind of speak up. Um, and I think a lot of it's been out, and we've heard this phrase used a lot in the last year or so, but a lot of it's been done through an abundance of caution, really. I think for the first time we've seen clients be really conscious of, you know, when they go out, their timing and um, data has definitely helped us kind of understand a lot of that. And I think also the understanding the trajectory of stories as well, you know, using data to understand, you know, what news will have an impact has definitely changed. I think, you know, we had quite clear models for a lot of things that helped us understand, you know, when we should launch things, what news would have what impact on, you know, the overall news agenda, where there would be potential white space and windows for us to do those things. And um, that's been completely thrown out of the window. And we've had to relook at all of those models. And we've had to really tailor and specialise some of those as well to make sure that, you know, we've got a good understanding by industry. Because um, it's hard to know, you know, exactly when the story is going to break. And then even if there is that white space, uh, as a couple of people have mentioned, something can drop in, you know, one morning, one evening and completely change yeah. the face of, of the media overnight. I don't know what we would do without Rob's team. Because it's all well and good for me to say the the, the media is like a la an avocado and you got to pick your moment. But I don't. I, I've thrown plenty of avocados away. 
But but what's possible with data and clients, as Rob says, are really switching on to this. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of us are having to e get educated pretty fast um, because it is possible to know, not guess. You just need someone like Rob um, to help you. Thanks for that, Richard, and, and, and thanks, Rob, as well. Um, I'm conscious that we're um, running close to end on time. Um, Ed, I wondered if we could come back to you briefly before wrapping up. I mean, thinking about all of the trends um, and various discussion points which have come about, if there was one piece of advice that you could share uh, with PR practitioners to keep them uh, in tune with the current trends of, of the and media landscape, what would that be? So I think it's kind of been, um, uh, I, I think it's been dealt with uh, to some extent in, in the discussion uh, before, but I think the key thing is that, the, you know, the, the, the bad news is already here. And um, uh, while, you know, it, it's, it's not just the case that we're going to have bulletins and you know um websites and stuff that go bad news bad news bad news bad news here's a bit to make you feel better um it definitely is that space which is around uh, solutions agency um and um you know allowing people to sort of i guess you know feel they are um part of something that is a, a really important space i think uh, for 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 brands to target and it completely echo everything that was said above around uh, authenticity, because, um, uh, you know, I really don't have anything more to add on that. It's been said very, very eloquently. But you, you can, you know, if you take those sort of, you know, those examples, the the clap, uh, Captain Tom and Marcus Rashford, you can see the real impact of, of, of authenticity. So it's that and it's solutions and agency that I think um, uh, people really need to be thinking about, because, you know, the big news items, uh, you know, they're here. Um, the changes, some of them will be permanent, some of them won't. Um, but essentially what we're seeing is a whole lot of, you know, social change and change in the media landscape that was happening anyway that has essentially been uh, accelerated. But um, solutions agency and authenticity would be, I guess, you know, if you were going to take away three words from me on this, uh, those would be them. Cheers, Ed. Solutions, agency and authenticity. We uh, make note of those. Um, are, are there any final comments from any of the panellists before uh, before we bring this to a close? Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in there, Corey. Uh, um, just to say, uh, more than anything, I appreciate that this conversation is happening. And, and I, it's crazy to me, actually, now that you think of it, <laughs> that this hasn't happened before. Uh, like, you know, I, I, and I think it's really healthy, really enjoy the different perspectives. Uh, and, and, and one can only think we'll get better, you know, whether it's from, you know, Ed's perspective or from, from uh, you know, uh, uh, an agency perspective or in-house perspective, you can only get better in trying to understand how to navigate the landscape. Um, it almost feels like we're going through what, you know, I imagine newspaper publications went through when, you know, news stories first went online and we're in, a, you know, a, a, another shift and hopefully we come out uh, having learned something. So thanks very much for, for having me. Yeah, hi, and um, Richard here. Just to say what a great conversation this has been and thanks for having, having me and Aura along as well. I think that that key point of authenticity is just so critical, isn't it? Um, and I, I would just like to reiterate with my, my evaluation hat on that, you know, pick up on something that Michael had said earlier as well, this this need to move beyond just sort of what, what you could call unauthentic or inauthentic um, metrics. You know, we need to, if we're going to prove value, not just be busy fools, um, we need to measure in a meaningful way. And I think something that blends both those two points together really nicely is what Ola was talking about, which is, was, was Captain Tom, of course, Michael Rashford. But with Captain Tom, um, last summer, Karma decided would take a look at the, you know, what actually happened there. You know, like, jeepers, you know, how did this happen? Somebody set out to raise a thousand quid, uh, got 33 million quid in 30 days. Um, how did that happen? And, and one temptation 
is just to look at the outputs and look at the tweets and the volumes and the impressions and and just produce some report with a whole load of numbers that are going off the dials. But what we did instead was we 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 put the best practice approach into practice in the report um, and and work with some different um, industry leaders in the PR and communications industry to identify six different trends um, and six different things, lessons, if you like, that you can learn from these authentic stories. And reassuringly for our listeners today that, that they are um, the power of PR because this was a PR driven event. There was no advertising or other marketing, of course, it was, it was purely a comms driven event. That the, the, the necessity for great authentic story, the necessity to understand the audience, the power of traditional media, it, you know, it isn't dead, uh, getting the content right and, and measuring right. And if, if anyone would like to see that report, uh, it's available for free on, on Calm's website at calm.com forward slash Captain Tom. So do go and, go and um, download it and take a look. Great. Thanks, uh, Richard. And Richard, um, perhaps you could share... Uh, any final thoughts and maybe some information on how people can access the viral news report? Uh, yeah, this is the bit where I where I make a misstep. Um, yeah, what you can access it um, by going to our website, which is um, www3 with a, the number three monkeyszeno.com. Um, and uh, you have to do a couple of clicks, but you can you can get the earned media report on there. I, I, I would encourage you to do so. I'm delighted to say, despite the speed at which everything is moving, it is not yet out of date, um, which which is a worry with the with the with the way things are going. Um, the great thing is, and 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 what what's really pleased me about this conversation is that we're being positive, that we're ending on a positive note, and it didn't feel like it was a reach to go there. And one of the one of the questions that we keep getting asked is, is are the changes that are taking place going to be permanent? Is it going to be like this forever? And, you know, who knows who can who can foresee the future? But I do know this. We cannot unlearn as an industry. I'm saying we cannot unlearn what we have learned about the importance of actually putting your money where your mouth is and meaning it. And that, for me, has been the most positive change in our industry that's come out of a very difficult uh, period of time in the pandemic and uh, and to be thinking positively it's not just that the sun's shining which it is but uh, <laughs> that's the takeaway and yeah if you look at our report um don't get too gloomy because there are solutions there yeah yeah i think that's a brilliant note to to end on and i can hear the birds tweeting in the background as well richard to, to yes talk about. <laughs> yes they are They're, they've come out to play Thank you. Thanks very much. And thanks to all our panellists and indeed to everyone in the audience as well. I um, hope you found the discussion useful um, and we look forward to welcoming you back to another one of these discussions uh, very soon. But that's all from us for now and I uh, hope everyone has a lovely day. Thanks very much, everyone. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.